This is an RNZ podcast. Kia ora and welcome to the Kim Hill Collection. Jacqueline Fahey is a painter and a writer. She's a part of one of New Zealand's golden generations of artists in the mid-20th century. And, uh, of course, she's a very interesting person with many excellent and noteworthy achievements. But above all, Jacqueline Fahey is a character. She came on Saturday morning a few times over the years and was a delight on each occasion. This particular interview is from 2006, and she's on to chat about one of her memoirs. This interview was recommended by... Kim's producer, Chris Burke, who was a huge help in putting this list together. So thanks very much for that, Chris. Hope you enjoy it. Jacqueline Fahey's bold expressionist paintings have been coloured by her flamboyant personality and her feminism for over 40 years now. She was, in fact, one of the first New Zealand artists to paint from the feminist perspective. In her 70s now, she's just published a memoir of her youth. It's called something for the birds and she is of course still painting and she's with me now in Auckland studio hi jack and how are you i am good and that song was very apropos far what away did happen, what did happen to us all what did happen to us all <laughs> well you yeah. try to rediscover that in your memoir was yes. it an easy right for you well it um i wasn't exactly conscious it was a compulsion Mm. it reads like and this is no insult intended a stream of consciousness to a certain extent yeah well it was a compulsion to record you know to especially about my parents to not see them go you know erased not you know to be recorded in some way there is something about being the last person to recall certain things as well, isn't there? Well, I listened. I listened to Mum and listened to Dad. And they went back quite a long way when they were having streams of consciousness, you know, in walks and talks. Both your parents sound not ordinary. Well, I don't... I think you'll agree with this. I don't think anybody is if you really know them. No, well, that's absolutely right. But there they were in Timaru. Your mother was a very gifted pianist. Your yes, she was, was a, indeed. A, f- a socialist, dentist. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Not that there's any contradiction in that. No. And you were Catholics in a non-Catholic society. Yes, I think that was the biggest difference. That sort of cultural gap, that lack of comprehension... Um, that you know the what I was also another compulsion to write it was to try to make it a broader issue I mean Maori suffer the same thing don't they that assuming assumptions they hear a name they make all sorts of connections with it well I must say I was taken aback to discover the level of prejudice you encountered yes I know but you see don't forget I'm quite a lot older than you and in those days, I'm afraid, I'm telling it, believe me, it was more than that, but I'm telling it like it happened. What do you think the explanation for that is? Well, I think that a lot of those families were driven out of Ireland by the, the troubles, you know, by uh, the revolution that was coming. Um, they were dispossessed by Irish Catholics. They didn't, I mean, they took on English uh, style, English behaviour, you know. But in fact, when I looked into it later, a lot of those names were actually Southern Irish names. Uh. But they were not ascendancy, but Protestant. It does seem amazing though, doesn't it? In In a country like New Zealand, which ostensibly one came to to escape the class system only yes. to reimpose a whole new oh, one. Oh, of course, ah. inevitably. Mm. I mean, people change your skies but not your soul, as they say. Mm. Well, you know, they brought everything with them, didn't they? Almost incidentally, actually, there's an extraordinary story about your father who was in a hospital. Yes, in... wasn't that extraordinary? Tell me that story. That, what happened was that he... Uh, look, I'm not even sure if he was wounded... I can't ask him now, or had got sick at sling camp. But he was sent to hospital, a lot of the soldiers were, to the castle. It was an army hospital. And he arrived just after the Easter Rebellion. And the nurses were 
you know, some of the brightest girls in Northern Ireland, you know, they were well educated and they were all into the Gaelic League and learning Irish. And uh, the Aran Island particularly was, a, you know, as you know, with the, what's the, the something of the Western world, you know, that great play. Oh, the Playboy? It did the Playboy of the Western world. Yeah. You know, that all those sort of things were centred around Galway and the Aran Islands. And Dad's name was a very well-known Aran Islands name. Sure. A thir- about a third of the gravestones there are F-A-H-Y. And he, ca- he, the nurses just took to him immediately. He was a handsome young man, you know, and a bit of a wit. And they loved that. But then they got him to go down underneath the building to the cellar where the heroes of the revolution had been shot. Extraordinary. Yes, so and they wouldn't clean up the blood. No. And they had said, kill us too. You know, they wouldn't let go of them. To think that your father saw the blood shed by the rebels during the Easter uprising. Yes, I know. Tragic, isn't it? Tragic, but also, you know, wonderful. And that de- Yes, divisive for him, though. Dad never solved that. Ah, you mean it preyed on his mind? Yes, it preyed on his mind. Mm. Well, so have... that he developed a very muddled attitude towards being Catholic, being Irish. Mm. What about you? No, our mind's not muddled. I, I associate... <laughs> not muddled. <laughs> mind's quite clear. You know, um, uh, uh, I think uh, the colonial uh, attitudes are the ones that it would be healthy for all of us in New Zealand to divest ourselves of now. You didn't like calling yourself a lapsed Catholic, you called yourself a fallen over Catholic. Yes, totally and completely (laughs) fallen over. (laughs) Well, and you do portray yourself as a fallen over woman from time to time. Well, exactly, exactly, because um, I, I don't want that gentility that often pervades the lives of women, you no. know. No, I well, mean, you certainly don't have that. No, goody, goody. <laughs> so, well, I mean, it annoys me with Rita Angus how she's been interpreted because I knew Rita very well, and Rita was like me. We were very alike. We shared the same politics and the same attitudes. And yet, to read about Rita, you would think she was some sort of sort of goofy spiritual woman with a halo round her head. Why do you think that we sanctified her? Oh, I don't know. I think it's appalling why we need to do that. Put her up on a false pedestal, which she wouldn't have liked. No. What about Doris Lusk? Oh, Doris the same. Mm. Doris equally um, uh, natural person, natural woman. Do you think that women get messed around with more, whereas men yes, are allowed to be themselves. Exactly. For... They don't mind telling the truth about a man. It only enhances him. Ah. But whereas with a woman, there is that, um, well, the shame that is imposed on women, isn't it? Even now, Even supposedly now? with the sexual revolution, give me a break. Yeah. You know, it's still, unless you have changed the social structure, things remain the same. If you haven't the money to have a baby out of marriage, you're going to be equally shamed, aren't you? Were you always bolshy in a kind of sexual political sense or is it only in retrospect that you can make sense of the way you were? Do you more, know what I mean? More of that, right. yes. I think, I think actually I, you're not, as you know when you're young, you're not conscious of how you appear to no. other people, are you? No. you j- it just happens. Although as an artist, you must have been more so. I mean, you can't do self-portraits without having a sense of yourself. No, funnily enough, doing a self-portrait's a curious thing. That So I, I listened to an art historian describing the look in Rita Angus's eye as she painted herself and what it meant. He was totally wrong. What it meant was that she was looking assessing herself so that you don't see yourself any better for painting yourself. You are painting like you'd paint a bowl of apples or you are seeing what is there. Or is it also what you want to be there? For example, the back cover of your memoir is Artist as Warrior. Yes. And this was a picture that you painted of yourself in 1958. Yes, when it began to dawn on me that becoming an older woman was going to be no joke then to be recognised. Excuse as a me, you series. were twenty-eight. Yes, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Did you feel old at 28? Well, I began to feel uh, uh, a sense of um, entrapment. You were you know. married? Yes. yes. Married is was tricky, you know. I mean... Uh, where, as my, that's why I put the, my letters to Fraser in. Yeah. It's a pity because I found his letters back later, oh. after just after it was too late to put them in. It was would pity. you have? Would you have put them in? Yes, I would. Quite have. happily. Yes, I would have. One should say, of course, if anybody doesn't realise, you were married to Fraser Macdonald. You married Fraser when you were twenty-six. Yes. And he almost immediately fell ill with with very serious tuberculosis yes, yes. and was was unable to do very much at all for six years? Yes, five years, six years, yes. Which had a huge effect on your life. I mean, it's hard yes. to remember about tuberculosis and what a scourge it I, was look, then. isn't it just? And when you think at that time, even then, um, you know, they it had, through the war, at the very end of the war, they discovered a penicillin, but it took for ages to work on old tuberculosis. But Fraser was one of the very lucky ones who did survive. Although there was doubt about whether he would. Oh, gosh, yes. Th those years, we uh, I was told if he didn't have, hadn't had that very life-threatening operation, he would have died within, say, the next six, seven, eight years. So you married a, a rising star in the medical world, exactly. as indeed did your sisters. Yes, exactly. And lo and behold, oh, you had it? an invalid on your hands. Exactly, yes. How did you feel about that? Um, well, as I said in the book, it brought us very close together. It was us against the world in the end, you mm. know. And your letters to him that you have published are very moving. I mean, you clearly yeah. adored him. Yes, yes. What was he like? Um, he sounds unusual for his time. I suppose what you would say now was he was a charmer. <laughs> you know, he and nice looking. I mean, there weren't somehow there weren't a lot of nice looking men around who could also read a book. You know, talk mm. to you, talk to a woman. But not an insincere charmer. No, 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 not at all. I mean, often the implication of that word is that it is something not to be trusted. And but often sounds... the Irish men uh, were denigrated for having that grace yeah. and that good language, mm. which was so stupid. I mean, obviously my grandfather had it. So you were already aware that Fraser was a very ill person when you painted Artist as Warrior. Yes, yes. Was that part of the strength of that painting, the realisation that you yeah. mm. would have to battle a number of things. Yes, yes. And, and, but also I began to realise when I talked to other artists, men, they or poets, that they didn't... They, they saw men as being the creative artist, not women. Mm. And if a woman was, then she would have to be like Rita Angus, someone who never married and who later they would not say they didn't find physically attractive. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that you could only have one gift. Mm. You couldn't have two. When you were at the Canterbury College School of Art, you were taught by Russell Clark and yes. Bill Sutton. Yes. Was that a macho world? No, but, uh, Russell Clark wasn't a bit macho. And he, if anything, favoured young women students. Uh, Favoured them? Yeah, well, yes, he did rather. <laughs> <laughs> and But uh, Bill Sutton favoured young men. so They was, balanced each other up. They balanced each other up. Yeah. But Bill, Bill was a good teacher to us too, you know, and um, so was Russell. I mean, they, were, they worked conscientiously and kept up their own art practice. I don't know how they did it. What was the reaction to your suburban neurosis series of paintings which talked about something that is common now but not yeah. so then no oh well i mean t um the the socialists took it up um you know the uh islands magazine remember islands uh -huh. um the predecessor of land for... that's right that's right and it, it it was on a very socialist base so they loved them and did a big article on them very early. And uh, that was where I discussed with 
Um, oh, what was his name? How could I forget? I haven't forgotten. It lies there somewhere. It lies there. It's just a question of getting at it. <laughs> it's just if you stop sense. thinking about it, it'll come to I you. I know it will. Anyway, we had a good talk about all that stuff, about how um, it's the beginning of what is now so appalling in America, the division of classes through food halls and clothes factories, you know, the, that the wage earners um, all have their own world, mm -hmm. you know, which doesn't impinge in any way on the upper classes at all. Right. And that would be almost the bulk of the population. And that was beginning to happen here. And that was really what we were talking about. So it became kind of a ghetto. It, it is, yes. And it's a way to, uh, uh, of isolating women from each other. Mm. Uh, you know, where they didn't have access to buses even often in those new um, dormitories that were built like Porrua outside Wellington. Yeah. And that's what I was... Th I wasn't specifically thinking of that. I was more thinking of the damage done to young women who'd been at university with me who now had families and seemed to have mentally deteriorated. Mm. You know, they had lost an interest... So did people ever criticise you for making family life sound less than ideal? Because you pulled no punches. I mean, a lot of your paintings about yeah. the, the domestic scene. In fact, you've said yourself, I think, that the, the real Greek tragedy is, is in the home, the battlefield the of the psyche. It is indeed. It always has been. Did people ever say, you know, you can't be saying these kind of things. We want our ideal nuclear family myth. Uh, yes, although I didn't mix with many what I, good Christians or whatever, you know. <laughs> I mean, they weren't the sort of people I was talking to. So Actually, a lot of the time I didn't see them. You did mix with extraordinary people and part of that was the fact that you waitressed at, at Harris Harrison's uh, absolutely, coffee Absolutely, absolutely. That was an opportunity. And the reason, well, an opportunity and a challenge, of course, because the reason yeah. that you waitressed there, I think, was to earn some cash because Fraser was laid up with the tuberculosis. Exactly, exactly. And it was a job where then... I had such perfect hours for visiting him. Tell me what, what Harry's coffee bar was like. It was about, uh, there was the centre of Bohemia, I suppose, in oh, Wellington, it was wasn't lovely. it? lovely, <laughs> yes. It was such fun. And above Parsons Bookshop, and um, uh, uh, the, this present Parsons up here was about an eight-year-old boy then. Huh. And huh. I, I, I was swanning around upstairs having the time of my life. Mixing with poets and artists. Yes, and yeah. Back, Jim Baxter was always there. Always? Nearly always. Was he? Yes. Did you, that you was had... when he had just become a Catholic. Oh, OK. And he had stopped drinking. And, um, you know, he was... He, we had a great argument one evening, which was so perfect, where I said that the trouble with the Catholic Church was that they gave no out for young women who got pregnant out of marriage, that they couldn't, that they had the baby, they had it taken away from them and they were punished for it. And if they had an abortion, they were equally punished, but that the only way to make it right would be to welcome the baby, you know, into yes. the world. And he said, right, we're going to... And sadly, he died... Oh, no, this must have been later because he died. This happened, this happened actually when we were at Kingseed. And he said, we will start something, you and I, we're going to start next week with the Catholic Church. They must hang the nappies in the nave, you know, in huh. the... Uh, in the presbytery. Huh. That is the new move that we're going to make together. But unfortunately, you see, he died uh, about a week after that. Were you surprised when he became a Catholic? No, not really. Um, it, I mean, I think it's much easier for men to become Catholics than women. Sure. But given his image and self-image of a kind of socialist... Egalitarian. Yes, yes, but don't forget, he was very influenced by his parents who loved the Republican movement in Ireland. Ah, sure. And every time they had a victory, they all stood up and cheered. Mm. And the Easter Rising for them was a moment of great celebration. So he was already with people like Maud Gone or Constance Makovic, you know, those women who became Catholic. Ah. He would have that example, wouldn't he? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. What was it like for you to live 
in virtually in the premises of the psychiatric hospitals that Fraser worked in, Carrington, Kingsley, Porridor. But I suppose, as I spent, you know, I would say I spent most of my life in all the mad houses of New Zealand. <laughs> yes. I mean, people who worked in those places in those days always called the mad houses. They never went in for mental health or, <laughs> you know, nut houses or clients yeah. or all that rubbish. You know, you called a spade a spade. Somebody is mad, but most of us are, was the final decision. Uh, you know, that patients are just the ones that are locked up. So did you find it at all worrisome or depressing? Uh, well, not really, because, um, you know, as you know, in general life, there are lots of maniacal people around, aren't there? Yeah, there are, but we are able to pretend that they're basically all right. Oh, I don't know that we do, do we? Don't we say to each other when they see some, we see someone approaching, oh, my God, that mad guy, you know, he's simply terrible. So at least you knew where you were. I knew where I was. I well. did, it, it, it didn't seem like strange territory to me, really. In fact, you know, the only difference is, as I say in the book, is that the ones in hospital can't look after themselves. Mm. You know, they can't feed themselves properly or keep themselves clean things like that, and that's really why they're in hospital. There's the dedication in your book is a, is a quote of Constantine Kavafi. Oh, I love that, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I do, but it seems to echo throughout the book and in everything you, you're saying at the moment. He's yeah. writing in, what, 7th century AD. Yes, isn't it amazing? And he says, Out of talk, appearance and manners, I'll make you an excellent suit of armour, and in this way... I'll face malicious people without the slightest fear or weakness. Yes. Do you feel that you did that, that you created a self that could yes. face down yes. a whole lot of things, whether it be, you know, anti-Catholicism or... Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And you obviously did it very successfully. Well, I don't know how successful. I mean, it's an ongoing thing. It's a process, isn't it, that never comes to an end. Mm. But um, I But you think... never lost sight of, no, of what, of what you I wanted to become. Oh, okay. I knew what I wanted to be, to become. Mm. You know, I thought of myself when I was young as, like most young people, shallow and foolish, but I wanted to become something. So on the front cover, you have a self-portrait which was painted ten years before the back cover artist as yes, Gloria. Yes, that's right. And it's it's pretty. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, a, a challenging mm. look in the eye, Yeah. but it's certainly an mm. acceptable... Yeah. Young woman. Yes. And on the back cover, you've got this... Yes. <laughs> tough, the, the emergent tough psyche. <laughs> Is that what you see the journey as? Well, no, not really. I mean, I, for that, that was that realised specifically about my painting. That was to, meant to say to male artists and poets, to say to them that the palette is my shield, the brush is my weapon, mm. and... With this, I will discover myself. You know, I will become an artist. I will become a person. And then I will be a woman. You have a, um, an exhibition opening on Wednesday, I think, in, um, in Auckland. Well, it, it, would, it would opened on... Yes, it opened on the night of the book launch last Wednesday. Oh, all right. And it's family portraits? Well, it's not... It, sort of, yes. Actually, just after I finished the book, in a month, I dashed off three portraits of Fraser. Oh. Really, it brought it all back. I'd never really used those drawings I did at Pororua in 61. Mm. And suddenly, I could see how to use them. How strange. So you yes. stirred up the memories. Exactly. Uh. And then it just came quite almost unconsciously. So how much are you painting now? Well... You know, while I wrote the book, I didn't paint. No. But usually I paint every day. And you feed the birds and you live in Grey Lynn. Exactly, and that's about the round. That's about as much as I can cope with. You mean that you want to cope with? Yes, that I want to cope with. All right, because yes. you're fit, aren't you? Yes, I walk every day. Yeah. When Fraser died, how hard was it for you? Oh, well, you know, it, the whole thing... It was the weirdest feeling. Um, I think we've all gone through that with death. It's grief from someone disappearing, you know, into the void like that. Comes as if out of the void unexpectedly when you least expect it. Mm. You know, I could talk 
to people prepared about years. I, but I could never say the words, Fraser is dead or has died. So for a, about a year afterwards, and if someone came upon me suddenly and I had to tell them, I couldn't. And then I would crack up. And it could be anybody, the gardener, anybody. Mm. It's very, very nice that you've rediscovered him in canvas then now, yes, isn't exactly. it? Yes, exactly. Yes, and I've done him sort of glamorous golden <laughs> boy, you know. That's nice. Yes. That's lovely. Thank you very much for your time, Jacqueline. It's, um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Oh, goody. Jack and Fahey's book is called Something for the Birds and it's published by Auckland University Press.